Great. Um, so, hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Aziza, and I lead uh, GA in Asia. Um, GA is a global education company. We focus on some of the most in-demand skills in areas like tech, data, and design. Um, and we work with both individuals, enterprises, as well as governments. Um, a lot of people, they come to GA to learn these tech skills to you know, further themselves in their careers. But we've also got a lot of people who use the tech skills that they acquire at GA to build startups of their own. So one of the things that we've heard from our community is that you know, they wanted more programming around um, you know, how do you really think about uh, you know, starting a business of your own? You know, what are the different like, areas that you should be thinking about? Um, and so we decided to create this uh, two-week event series called Lightbulb to Launch. Um, you know, it's a curated uh, program and we hope that it's helpful for anyone who is an early stage founder or someone who's even aspiring to start their own thing someday. All right. Um, and I just want to say a giant thank you to all of our speakers and partners um, who've like so graciously given us their time. This event series would not be possible if not for them. So thank you so much to all of our speakers and partners. Um, in terms of how to participate today, okay, so if you are joining us uh, from home, uh, you're going to notice that you're not going to be able to see the rest of your audience except me. Um, you know, the reason is because we do have a few hundred people who usually register for each of our events. Um, that's a lot of people to have on video. Um, and so we usually do it in just presenter mode. So you're going to be able to see Ravi when he presents. Um, in terms of how to participate today, you know, we still want to hear from you guys. So you can click on this chat box over here. Um, you know, just make sure that when you're chatting with people, you're clicking panelists and attendees um, so that everyone in the group can see it. Otherwise, it's auto set to just panelists, which means only Ravi and me can see it. All right. Um, and if you've got a Q&A, please pop it into the Q&A box. Uh, I'm going to be curating the questions for Ravi at the end of this, because usually we might have like two to three questions that are overlapping. Um, so what I usually do is that I condense those and then I'll ask Ravi. The reason why I would love it if you guys ask this in the Q&A box is because, you know, um, I love having an engaged audience and we usually have a lot of like chat going on. So sometimes it's hard for me to just make sure that I'm not missing any questions. All right. Um, and also wanted to give a plug uh, to some of the events that are coming up next week. So we've got David from HubSpot, um, who's going to be talking about how you should think about marketing. You know, there was this uh, article that was talking about how so much of uh, early stage companies' uh, money goes to like Facebook and Google for advertising. So if you're going to do that, you want to figure out how to get the most ROI for it. Um, and David's also been uh, headed marketing at uh, multiple startups. So he have great perspectives. And then we've got uh, Abhishek, who's going to be talking about, um, you know, really how you should think about UX design and how to create a great experience on your products and services. Abhishek, we're so lucky to have him. Um, he was actually with Sequoia before this, and he's consulted with multiple startups. So he's going to be bringing a great perspective, um, you know, and we've got uh, Bach, who is uh, leading Google's accelerators in Southeast Asia. He's going to be talking about how you should really think about building for scale with Google. He's going to be talking about some of the developer platforms and tools. So if you just go to lightbulb2launch.com, you're going to be able to see all of our events next week. Again, all of these events are free, but you just have to register so that you get the Zoom link to join. Um, and also, if you are one of the participants for our series, we are giving you a 50% off all of our paid workshops. So this is going to be Bootcamp 50. You can use this code. Um, and, you know, we would love to hear your feedback. Um, don't worry about noting this down. We're going to be sending this uh, form over to you. Sorry about that. That's basically my doorbell, the joys of working from home. All right. So and we would also love it if you could share with us, you know, share some love on social media. Um, here are our handles. Do go follow us. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, the most common question we get asked is when is the recording going to be available for this? It's after the series is over. We're going to be uploading it onto the website and we'll make sure to send everyone an email telling you that it's been uploaded. All right. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for today. Uh, so we have Ravi. He is a seasoned investment banker and entrepreneur. 
entrepreneur. Um, he is the CEO and founder of Capita. They are a fintech startup that is digitizing equity ownership in startups in the Southeast Asia region. So Ravi's got a whole load of experience in this field. He's got about 17 years in investment banking and corporate development in APAC. He's worked across all of the top um, I-banks, um, and he's worked with a ton of like founders as well. His areas of expertise includes things like capital raising, um, corporate finance advisory, m and principal investments, debt financing, and leverage finance, as well as corporate strategy. Um, he's also an angel investor in multiple startups in the region, and he enjoys working closely with entrepreneurs, advising them on transactions and strategy. So if you have any questions at all on, you know, how to allocate equity to people at various stages, how to think about your cap table, how to work with early stage employees, uh, do ask Ravi these questions. All right, Ravi, we can turn your video on right now. Awesome. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can share your screen. And then I'm going to go off video and it's all yours. I will, uh, you know, come back online. I'll, I'll still be here. Like I'll still be here in the background. My video is just going to be off so that everyone can see you. Um, and uh, towards the end, I'll curate some of the Q&As. Thank you, uh, Aziza, and thanks uh, to GA and uh, your entire team for having me here. Quite excited to speak to this audience about a, uh, a topic that I've worked for most of my career. So looking forward to this session. Let me share my screen and, uh, and we can kick off. Uh, can you... As you, you all can see my screen, excited to be talking about cap tables and ESOPs 101. Uh, we have uh, uh, like kept various, uh, you know, the audience would include current founders, people working very closely with founders and people who want to be founders in the future. So structured it as a 101. So we'll start with the very basics and try to get to uh, cover as many topics as possible in the given time and feel free to ask any questions uh, uh, in the in the Q and A, and we'll uh, we'll um, try and address as many of those. Uh, Aziza gave a detailed introduction. I think she's covered everything. Uh, I, I think I'll I'll just add like I've spent about. 20 years working alongside founders in various capacities in the finance function. Uh, last couple of years, being an entrepreneur myself and actually building a product in the very space to, to help uh, cap tables and ESOPs get managed better. Um, I'm an engineer by background, but uh, most of my career is, has been in finance. So um, uh, to kind of start with the why question. Uh, why do uh, people working in startups, why do founders, future founders need to care about cap tables and ESOPs? So if you think about, uh, you know, a founder, an entrepreneur, uh, then it's a multifaceted um, journey. You start with an idea and product and you bring a lot of energy to the table. You convince customers, partners along the journey. Uh, but there are four aspects of an entrepreneurial journey that actually get impacted by cap table. First is the capital itself. How do you raise money uh, and who you raise it from, the investors? And then how do you add capabilities? You, 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 you start with the vision, you convince a few people, customers, partners. You also need to convince people to come and join you. And those people bring capabilities into the system. All of those are effectively impacted by the topic uh, we, we uh, concern with uh, ourselves today, which is around cap tables and ESOPs. Um, so uh, what is a startup and how is it different from any other private company? Uh, I, I think the simplest way to define it is a startup is a fast growth or a private company that's designing itself for rapid growth or fast growth. And therefore, uh, if we kind of think about what makes a, com what makes a private company venture investable and turns it into a, into a, into a startup journey, it's essentially around um, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what do venture capitalists and you have an esteemed panel through this series that's talking about various aspects, what's the industry, what's the business model, what's the background of the founder, what's the relevant experience and do the founding team have skin in the game, what's the capital structure and what are like, you know, what, where, where does this take, what, what's, the, what's the end game for the startup. And, and so when you think about it, there are two aspects that cap tables and ESOPs actually cover, what's the skin in the game, how are founders incentivized and the team incentivized to build a 
great company. And then what's the capital structure? Is, is the company's ownership structured in a way that it remains venture fundable and is aligned to rapid or fast growth? I think these are the two key aspects of why you need to care about and think about cap tables and ESOPs very early in your journey as a founder. Having said that, so we, we, we said 101, so we'll start with cap table 101. What, what, what does equity represent? Equity uh, in a company or a share in a company is one unit of ownership in the company. And so there are two aspects that a share represents, what percentage of ownership you have of the company or you own in the company or and separately uh, 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 it may or may not directly link to the num uh, you, you unit of ownership what percentage of control or voting does it represent in the company so two key aspects that uh, equity represents it's it's also the tangible value for anyone looking to invest in a company what does equity help you do? Uh, first, it gives you capital. It helps you raise capital from financial investors. So you can take your idea, turn it into a company built product. It also help you acquire talent. And why does it help you acquire talent? It helps you acquire talent because you're giving a piece of ownership of your company that, 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 that you're building with a with a big vision uh, to other, other people to attract them to come and work and be a part of this journey and get, get a share of the upside. Uh, similarly, I think it, it also helps you build strategic relationships, both with financial strategic investors, typically advisors who you want to give uh, a little piece of the pie of your company to, to you know, for them to uh, bring their expertise and share that with you in, in building the company. Uh, and so what are the different aspects? Why do you need to, uh, I, what are the key aspects that you need to understand in terms of managing your own cap table, understanding your cap table? Cap table directly indicates the valuation of your company. And what's the dilution? Every time you raise some capital from external investors, how much does the ownership of existing investors decrease by? And, and, um, uh, and in a venture invested company or a startup that is designed for rapid growth, typically not all units are same and not all rights of all shareholders are the same. There are differential rights or special rights that uh, investors take when they come and be a part of your journey. And that all of that is the economics of all of that is captured in, in a cap table. The rules and the terms are typically typically captured in your term sheets and your shareholder documents. So cap table is the financial manifestation of what's already written in your legal documents. So um, what is a cap table? So cap table is nothing but a table of owners of the company and what percentage of the company they own. Uh, and that makes it, that makes it uh, relatively simple to understand. That's oversimplifying it. But at the end of the day, if you understand your cap table, you know exactly who owns what percentage of your company. Uh, and and, and uh, why does this become complex? It's just, a, it's, a, you know, at the end of the day, it can just be a list of names or stakeholders and percentage of uh, you know ownership against their names, but why does this become more complicated? Because there is not just one instrument of ownership in a venture funded or a fast growing startup. There are multiple classes of shares. In other words, not every unit or every every security have equal share. So, um, uh, so how do we go about building uh, this uh, this cap table? So, what you do typically in a cap table is you have different instruments of ownership. So, one is an ordinary share, which is typically created when you incorporate your company, and that's where it all begins. Uh, and then you have different classes of shares, typically preference shares. So in a venture funded startup that goes from a C to a series A to a series B, uh, you keep adding different uh, classes of shares or securities to your cap table. So there's ordinary shares, and there is seed shares, which is basically all the shares that you have uh, created or preference shares that you have created for your venture investor to come in in your seed round. And then you have a series A, series B, and you know the journey continues. So uh, it is effectively a table of who owns which particular class of shares and how many of them. And essentially all of this, that translates into what's the economic ownership of a company. So one, the simplest way to know you understand your cap table really well is to know in various scenarios that can play out, what is this concept of fully diluted ownership? So what to understand these various classes of shares, effectively with any particular security in the company will convert based on certain rules and certain 
um, terms and preferences into ordinary shares and understanding how they convert into an ordinary share in the company will give you a list. It's essentially translating a multiple tables of different classes of shares and percentage of ownership into one unit, which is the common share. And if you can understand how each of those classes convert into common shares at the end of the day, then you get this concept of fully diluted. So the moment you're able to convert your existing cap table, which is multiple classes of shares, multiple owners, uh, having paid different prices or owning different instruments to convert everything into an ordinary class and convert it into fully diluted shares. And you know exactly what percentage of the company uh, he or she owns or any institution owns. That's when you have fully understood your cap table. So three simple things. Cap table is a table of ownership. Uh, how is it built? It's multiple tables, nested tables of various different instruments that and how much of that people own. And to fully understand what it means in various scenarios, these instruments all convert into a different number of uh, common shares or ordinary shares. And if you can get to that fully diluted table of ownership, then you fully understand your cap table. So it's as simple as, uh, as, simple as understanding these three elements. So uh, we talked about uh, on the earlier slide, what are different types of uh, equity ownership, uh, you know, diff I, I, we talked of different classes of shares in a company. Uh, and, uh, and so what are typical in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a standard startup journey, in a venture funded startup, what are the typical kind of securities you are likely to encounter or you might encounter? Um, first is, uh, you know, you, you can broadly think of this in six, six different buckets. You, you know, you can keep slicing and dicing them to understand more, but these six buckets typically, typically cover most of, um, most of the aspects of securities that you'll need to understand a cap table. The first thing is what I mentioned, common equity or equity versus preference shares. So every time venture investors in a friends and family round or uh, in a, you know, in a series A round, seed round and so on, each one of those typically come with a separate class of shares with certain rights and preferences, which are different from common uh, common shares. Most of the time they convert one is to one, which means one preference share converts into one equity share and they have additional rights and preferences, but it's not necessary. Many oftentimes you would see one preference share converting into uh, uh, a, uh, having a ratio or a multiplier in terms of how many common shares it converts into. So the, uh, so the basic difference, a common share, all common shareholders in a company are equal, a preference shareholders in a company of a particular type of preference share will all have certain rights that are different from ordinary shareholders. And so when you raise funding for your company, you typically negotiate these rights and that's what gives a preference uh, share a unique, uh, uh, unique rights and terms and preferences over common shareholders. Um, there are convertible or redeemable instruments. So these are not shares to start with. So in regulatory filings, you won't find them because they are not actually shares or share classes in a company, but they convert into share classes or some of them, depending on the scenario, may convert or may redeem, which means investors just get their money back and they take, collect some interest and, 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 and go away. So, uh, Convertibles are basically instruments which are not shares to begin with, and they convert upon certain scenarios into common shares. Uh, the third aspect to understand is there may be differential voting rights, and this is becoming more and more common today as founders dilute themselves significantly as they raise multiple rounds of funding. So their ownership decreases in terms of economic ownership, but they would like to have a differential control in terms of voting. And, and in, in, where, in jurisdictions where this is permitted, you, you can typically see um, uh, multiple classes of shares having multiple voting rights. So not a, 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 a preference share may have a differential voting right from a common share. Uh, then, then there are debt instruments, which, which can be quasi, when, when they can be redeemable, they, they, they can just be uh, debt instruments with some uh, warrants attached, which is, uh, which is the last bucket. Warrants are basically options. So it's the option of this person that holds this instrument to actually convert them into equity. Uh, or simply they can be just convertible notes, which are uh, more like debt instruments than equity instruments, which means they never impact your shared, shared uh, cap table if they're not convertible. 
Uh, there are you you often come across come across these terms safe and kiss these are nothing but standardized convertible instruments which means uh, uh, you know to 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 make the journey easy for startups uh, some standardization has taken place in the industry which is quite good and and so you can actually use uh, you know a safe or kiss instruments which are standardized convertible notes so uh, which which reduces the paperwork and uh, that uh, you you may need to do to uh, get in uh, you know to raise money at a very early stage, typically used in early stages of a company. So what are three things that you, you, you may need to keep in mind? One is, is the valuation of the company fixed, typically true when you're raising around with equity or preference shares. Uh, is there any performance linkage? Is the valuation changed depending on certain milestones that you hit in the company? And the third and typically used in case of convertible notes is the valuation fixed when you raise the money from investors, so they exactly know what percentage, or is it determined in future uh, based on valuation of the next round, typically true of convertible security. So when, when valuation is fixed, you exactly know what percentage of the company you're giving away. When valuation is performance linked or linked to next round valuation, the exact percentage of your company you're giving away to investor that is not determined at the time of investment, but gets calculated in the future. And this logic is often captured with a cer certain set of parameters in your cap table. Um, so uh, in addition to this, uh, th there are certain rights and preferences, which is not usually captured, uh, but may impact the cap table from time to time. Uh, not captured in the cap table, but captured in the documentation is, uh, you know, what are preference rights? So when you say this is not, this is a unit of the company, a share of the company, but it's a preference share and not an ordinary share, that preference usually translates, translates into a set of rights uh, um, and uh, obligations for the company, rights for the investor in terms of what, what that, that particular set of investors get. Uh, and important to understand those. Um, uh, second is dilution, anti-dilution. So investors, when they invest, may actually seek some protection in case the price of a share price of a converted share actually drops in future, which means uh, they ensure that their percentage is not impacted because you are raising money or, or the percentage is adjusted for when you're raising money at a lower valuation in future. Some investors ask for most favorable kind of clauses, which means if you were to give any uh, additional preferences to other investors in the future, they have like a most favored nation clause, which means they would also get those rights and preferences. Um, the other aspect which you would often see in cap tables is whether it's participation or non-participative, um, which is um, in case of a participation right, um, uh, an investor usually gets his preference. He gets his preference first and he may or uh, essentially the investor gets, uh, if he's a participation, right, investor can double dip, which means he would get his share first and then participate as if when all the shares are converted again, uh, when it is non-participative, he, he has to choose between uh, getting his preference rights first in terms of economic ownership uh, or, or not. So uh, again, participation, non-participation is better, uh, you know, uh, is better explained through more financial models or simulations. So I won't get into details of that, but if anyone wants to understand that a bit more, feel free to, uh, you know, write to me and I can send you some uh, simulations and links which make those easy. So these are typically rights and this would be covered also in detail in some of the legal sessions that have been organized as a part of this series. So I won't go into those more. We'll stick to the economics of a cap table, which is how should you think about ownership? Uh, so with that, uh, I, I would like to kind of, this is a one-on-one session. So think of cap table as a table of owners of the company and what percentage. Uh, the table typically doesn't in the in a startup journey doesn't exist in the form of one contiguous table, but a series of nested tables because you have various instruments you raise money with. Uh, but to really understand your cap table, you have to convert all of those various tables into a single table, which means you have to look at uh, every preference class in terms of uh, in terms of equivalent of ordinary class. And when you can actually understand what the fully diluted ownership, which means converting everything into common shares, that's when you can say you have really understood your cap table. Um, so I leave that thought on cap tables. With that. Um, I'll move to the next topic in the, the second part of the topic in the interest of time, which is around ESOPs. So how should you ESOPs 
uh, ESOP is one particular form of a generic category of instruments called equity awards. So what are we doing? What are you doing when you, when you think of ESOPs? You're giving a piece of your company to your employees. So you want to make many more owners so they are well incentivized. They also get a benefit of the upside in the company. And that is, uh, that is uh, a, the generic term for that is giving an equity compensation or equity awards. I like the term equity awards more than equity compensation. Uh, and ESOP is the most standard form, is the most commonly used form of uh, equity awards. So we'll talk about why, how, when, and to whom. Uh, that ESOPs are typically given. So again, starting with the why question, why should startups give equity compensation? Uh, because it aligns everyone who's working in the company with value creation. Your company becomes more valuable. Uh, people actually create part of that value. And if you think about this, this has been the single largest source of wealth creation uh, in the Silicon Valley and uh, and then later in China, now in this part of the world and the startup, startup ecosystems becomes stronger and more powerful. So when there is a large IPO or eventual listing or a SPAC merger and or a liquidity event for any startup, all employees who own a piece of the company actually um, uh, get benefit of the upside of, of, the, of the value creation journey that they've been a part of. It drives the entrepreneurial behavior. I mean, the one way to think about it is like employees workers look for compensation. Uh, investors look for returns. If you want to drive contribution, you want to make everyone an owner in the company. And so if you, if you think of that framework, you want as many people thinking like owners in your company, and you need that when you're a small company trying to disrupt a large space with many large incumbents. Uh, so this is essentially a tool for employee participation in the company. It's also a tool for employee retention because uh, the value creation is in the future. So it incentivizes employees to stay for longer and, and uh, uh, see that and ride that journey, startup journey to see the upside. Very early in the journey of a startup, it also... Um, uh, helps you conserve cash uh, when you're when you're work building a startup with limited capital, rather than giving salary or cash ba cash based compensation, you are able to actually use equity as a unit uh, of of uh, a unit of incentive uh, to to share that with your employees. So very early it, it in the startup journey, it helps with cash conservation, but the, it, Throughout the journey, it helps with various other aspects. The other thing to remember is for venture investable startups, almost every venture capital term sheet these days that is given to a startup will have some clause around ESOPs because as a venture investor, I want the entire team to be incentivized to make the startup journey a success. And why, why are these two topics related? Basically, it's a unit of ownership in your company. So when you think of fully diluted cap table, every employee owner becomes a part of that fully diluted cap table. And therefore, you, you know, these two are invariably interlinked. It's basically a unit of ownership in your company. Um, so I talked about uh, this a little bit earlier. There are various types of share uh, equity compensation or equity awards that uh, uh, you can give uh, within a company. It's, uh, it's basically various type of instruments, just like there are multiple classes of securities we talked about, like common shares, preference shares, convertible notes. There are multiple types of instruments which you can use to give an employee a share. The simplest form is to just simply give shares or share awards, uh, which is just giving employee shares in the company. Uh, the most common form of equity awards that is practiced throughout the world and it's almost uh, like you know 90% of of the time uh, this particular to uh, this particular instrument is used is an esop or an employee stock option plan uh, and and therefore you know oftentimes you see esops being used as a generic term when you want to really talk about equity awards um, there are uh, variations of esops which is employee stock purchase scheme or uh, esops we are trust vehicle there are also newer forms of uh, and and uh, newer forms of uh, the, these uh, instruments like restricted stock units or uh, stock appreciation, appreciation rights and phantom shares which have come into play and these are becoming more and more popular but ESOP remains the predominant form of employee uh, equity awards. Um, so uh, we'll talk about ESOPs in a little bit more detail. What is an ESOP? It's an option for the employee, uh, typically used for employees sometimes used for advisors as well because you want some experts and you want a share of their time to give some lend some expertise to your company this is typically strategic advisors in your journey 
so they get uh, uh, advisory options or advisory shares from time to time. Uh, it's uh, so ESOP itself is a right. It's not an obligation. It's an option for a com for an employee or the beneficiary or the recipient who receives these ESOPs to buy a share buy shares in the company, uh, and therefore it's a derivative instrument. It's an option to purchase shares in future at a specified price, and that specified price is is the strike price. Typically, options have vesting uh, vesting periods, and this is this is a way for you to uh, distribute this uh, this award over a period of time. The most uh, most of the time you see uh, four years as a typical vesting schedule, but we have seen anywhere between uh, two years to seven years as a practice in the industry. That's uh, the period over which uh, stock options given to employees in the company that uh, uh, typically vest. And what's the value of an option? Value of the option is the current value of the share it converts into. Typically, options convert into common shares, and that is how they become part of the fully diluted cap table. Uh, and so you can think of the value in an option as the value of your fully diluted common share today minus the strike price at which the option has been given uh, to the to the beneficiary or the employee and that is the value or the, the value of the option for an employee at any particular point in time um, so what does uh, what is the process like that uh, or what 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 are the various steps you need to think of when you're issuing esops to your employees first is creating a pool um, and this is typically a part of your cap table part of your agreement with your investors i mentioned term sheets mention uh, employee esop pool uh, when venture investors give a term sheet to a company so which which is essentially a pool of shares that have been allocated or set aside to be awarded to employees and uh, typically this pool ranges from 5% to 15% and changes also based on the stage of the company uh, and and uh, that, that that, um, and, and most most of the time, somewhere in between five to fifteen percent. Anything outside of that is non-standard. But we have seen uh, we have seen a few few of those cases. Uh, typically created as a part of every funding round or topped up to a certain number as a part of every funding funding round. Second is creating a plan, which essentially means what are the strike prices at which we want to issue? Am I going to uh, issue them at a lower strike price than the current value of the shares? So there's immediate value or am I going to give it at current value? So I incentivize future value creation. So people only get a, a share of the upside from the date of the grant. Um, Typically, it is board governed or a subcommittee of the board governed, and so you may need to get approvals into place to uh, to uh, to create the ESOP plan. Uh, the next step is actually granting the awards, which is actually giving letters to your employees saying this is the percentage. And what do those uh, um, you know letters typically contain? They contain three things. They contain vesting. You know, is it simply based on time or is it based on your performance? Are you and what is at what intervals are you getting which share of awards? So typically in the past we've only seen annual vesting. It's very common to see quarterly and monthly vesting these days, which means every month a portion of your equity awards or ESOPs actually get vested. Uh, vesting is nothing but ownership transferring to you for the time and the efforts and the value creation have already contributed to the company. So typically you typically when you leave a company, you actually lose the unvested portion of your ESOPs and the vested portion of your ESOPs, depending on conditions in the ESOP plan, you can either convert them to shares or not, but you usually keep it with you and you should be able to convert in future. This is at least the standard, um, uh, the, the industry standard that it, that one should aim for. Uh, so exercise price, this is basically when you can exercise that option and convert it into a share when it becomes actually uh, a legal ownership of a company and reflected in all the regulatory filings and not a contract between the company and the and the shareholder. So the difference between a share and an option is an option is still a contract between the company and the, and, and the option holder. And the moment it gets exercised into a share, it is a legal form of ownership, which is recognized under uh, 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 the company law jurisdiction of, vari uh, of various jurisdictions, and you actually find a place in the regulatory filings of the company as well. 
in terms of uh, actually getting a unit of the share. Uh, and what are the other things that are typically there in your employee stock options? When can you sell? When can you sell your options? Or does the company have any rights to buy back the shares that are vested with you? And so on. So typical conditions around when you can exercise, when you can sell the shares after exercise, or are there clauses around company buying back the shares when you decide to leave the company? These are some of the things that are uh, incorporated into an ESOP plan. Um, so what are the decisions? What are the decisions that you need to take from a company perspective and from an individual perspective? So first, let's talk about size and quantum. So typically, there's a pool size, which is agreed by the shareholders, because an ESOP plan effectively dilutes ownership of all existing shareholders, because it forms a fully part of the fully diluted cap table. And therefore, there are shareholder implications. There are also market factors in terms of what size of pool do you need to create, uh, depending on your growth plan, you have to attract X number of people and X amount of talent. And and, and therefore, uh, you know, what does it cost you from a market perspective? So that's an overall pool size from a company aggregate perspective. From an individual perspective, how should you think of quantum? It's typically you think of it, the three or two or three frameworks. You think of it as overall cost to the company. What is the cost to the company of an employee? That includes if your fixed pay, your variable pay, and your equity-based uh, incentives. The second way to think about it is discount to market price. You're attracting talent from an established incumbent. Uh, you can't actually compensate for that fully in, in, you know, in, in cash-based compensation or salary. And therefore, uh, what, what, how do you make up and create give, give, uh, give some uh, upside? The third way to think about it, and probably the best framework to think about it is, what's the value creation if a person contributes X amount of value in the, cre in, in the growth of the company? How do you uh, accommodate that? And, and, and similarly around distribution, uh, I think I talked about this uh, before, uh, various founders have various frameworks. Uh, uh, do I give it only to key management? Do I give it only to those who are driving sales or value creation? Or do I make it org wide? I think uh, it's more and more common to see wider and wider distribution. And this is what have uh, actually led to uh, successful companies bringing back what I said earlier in this conversation that if you think of pe pe every one of your employees are owners of a company, then every one of those owners is thinking of contribution. So you want, uh, you know, in an ideal situation as wide as possible. Um, how to structure these ESOPs? Are you just rewarding people for time or performance? Both can be baked into a particular grant or an award. Over what's the tenure? Am I giving this over vesting over four years or am I vesting it over two years or combinations and so on? Um, and engagement, uh, you, you give these letters, but how do you engage your employees? Remind them continuously, keep them informed. There's a lot of engagement with employees around their compensation, which is fixed and variable, but we have generally seen as a practice because systems are not used. There's not a lot of engagement around ESOPs, particularly in this part of, uh, this part of the world. And as startup ecosystem matures and we're seeing more and more successful companies, that engagement piece is also increasing. Uh, I won't go into great amount of detail here, but it, this is basically impacts three parts of your organization in terms of functions. It, it impacts your HR function because people uh, tend to think of this as compensation as a part of a pay package, overall incentives to work in your particular startup, but it has accounting implications, which is why your CFO, financial controller, people in the finance team get impacted. Once you give stock-based compensation, you'll have to account for it. Uh, it has taxation implications, uh, and this is particularly on individuals, what happens upon exercise, what happens upon sale of shares, and different jurisdictions have different tax regimes, and uh, these are, you know, upon exercise, these are classified as income, in some jurisdictions as high as 40% or above, in some jur jurisdictions lower. If it is a sale of shares, sometimes it's capital gains tax as well. Uh, the value at which you got the share and the value at which the, you, know, you, you find an exit. So uh, it has taxation implications. So three departments get impacted with ESOPs and therefore staying organized from very early on is important. Uh, what are different documentations that get involved in an ESOP? Your shareholder agreement to create the pool, the scheme document to put a set of rules around what how the overall um, uh, ESOPs are governed. Valuation certificates, typically for accounting, to get the fair market value. 
board approvals to actually give certain share of compensation to certain employees. Typically, uh, bo board approval is required for like senior hires, uh, uh, higher amount of ESOPs. The grant letter itself, that is every individual who gets ESOP compensation gets a grant letter. The grant letter usually has a vesting schedule in it. What, what happens with an exercise and what are the, um, you know, uh, uh, documentation on what, how, when you can sell, when you can get liquidity on those ESOP, ESOPs and so on. Yeah, so what are the some of the market practices? It's almost there in all VC term sheets in our part of the region. Most successful startups have it. The quantum I mentioned is 5 to 15%. Not all private companies have it. Usually fast growth companies, uh, in, which are classified as startups, uh, have it. Uh, it, uh, it. It's not common in all private companies. That's changing too. Uh, and in terms of engagement and culture, vesting and tenure is standard in this part of the world. If you compare it to the Valley or any of uh, you know more evolved startup ecosystems, uh, engagement and communication is lower in our part of the world. Distribution org wide is also not there. It's typically reserved for a small set of employees. Uh, avenues for liquidity and uh, monetization are also lower. And so um, we are actually working to solve some of uh, some of these problems in this region as Capita itself. Um, I, I will skip that. Why is cap tables and ESOPs important to stay organized from the very beginning? So you're transaction ready. This is a unit of ownership, not knowing who owns what parts percentage of your company is not a great position to be in when you want to raise future rounds of uh, funding. And so what are the typical documents that are looked at when you when due diligence is done on your company for future investments by investors, your ESOPs, your share certificates, grant letters, the statutory registers, which is your ACRA filing in Singapore or a re registrar of companies and uh, registrar of companies in India and so on, your company secretary filings, board resolutions, and your investment documents, which is your SHAs, SSAs, and so on. So these are typically documents that impact your cap table and your ESOPs. Uh, my last slide, why should you care about this as a founder or a future founder or someone working in a startup? Uh, cap table impacts ownership. Uh, so cap table, shareholders, dilution, legal documentation, future transactions. So it usually consumes quite a bit of founder time and attention. It impacts the team, uh, talent attraction and retention, uh, cash costs and morale of the company as well. Uh, and it impacts multiple functions, accounting, taxation, payroll, compliance, HR. So uh, it, it pays to give attention to the uh, cap tables and ESOPs from the very start. It's a unit of ownership of this baby that you're going to build over the next 10, 15 years. Uh, and, and therefore uh, uh, staying organized from early on will be extremely useful uh, in a startup journey. Um, yeah, uh, this has traditionally been managed on spreadsheets and paper documents. And uh, where Capita is, uh, uh, is trying to innovate is to bring systems in this part of the world with uh, legal jurisdictions in this part of the world. This part of the world for us is Southeast Asia and India. And that's where we're building a system to manage cap tables and ESOPs. Uh, so yeah, that's where we can, we can help for founders, future founders, even employees. If you want to understand what your ESOP means and what's the true ownership you have, uh, that, that is what we automate uh, at Capita. And that's where we are building a platform to uh, to organize this. So I will pause here um, and take questions and quite excited to see what questions uh, that you have for me. I'll stop well, sharing my screen, Aziza. Sounds good, Ravi. Um, Ravi, thank you so much for that. That was a masterclass in basically how to think about these types of things. And I'm sure a lot of founders felt that very helpful. We had a lot of people in chat, like just talking about how helpful this was. We have a ton of questions. We've got 16 questions. I don't think we're going to be able to get through all of the questions, everyone. But what I can see is that there are definitely overlaps in a lot of uh, these types of questions. Um, so I'm just going to like uh, start with, uh, you know, when you talked about voting rights, what are super voting rights in what are super voting rights shares and when in the process should they be introduced? Maybe we can just keep the answers like really short so that we can get through as many as possible. Yeah, so voting is about control. Uh, it's uh, different from economic ownership of a company. It's like, so as you keep raising multiple rounds, the founders and the co-founders, how much they own of a company keeps going short. And you, typically how many people you have on the board and how governance is structured in a board is linked to ownership in the company. So when ownership goes below a certain level where the number of 
representatives that founders have on the board is uh, is uh, is going is is lower and founders would like to retain control so they drive the future direction of the company that's when they typically get introduced it's always a negotiation it's it's a it's a it's a transfer of rights between shareholders to founders and therefore uh, it's usually negotiated position but when it comes into play is when the founder ownership is lower or the founder board representation is lower than uh, and and uh, lower than investors or share and shareholder base is wider and shareholders own a, you know investor shareholders own a large part of the company and that's that's when you basically uh, get into play uh, thinking about that early on is useful uh, but this is a negotiated position so typically comes into play when there's a shift in that balance of control uh, in terms of decisions made in the company okay sounds good thank you so much ravi so the next question we have is around um, you know we've got about three to four questions that are all around like thinking about your cap table in the early stages. So Arjun's asking, you know, um, it, say there's a lead investor and then there are angels, friends and family. Are there any advice on how to make sure you're not overcrowding your cap table? And somebody yeah. else asked, uh, what are some of the common instruments that you see offered at various stages of fundraising? Um, and also, you know, if you've got any other like reading resources on how to learn more about cap table and various classes of debt and equity. Yeah. Um, so overcrowding of cap table. I like uh, you know that's a that's a that's a that's a pet topic for me to talk about. Why is that a problem, or why sh why is uh, why should why why that can be an advantage? Is is two ways you can think about that. So typically you don't you you don't you think about overcrowding because of management uh, of that many investors, that many shareholders. But uh, and another way to kind of you flip the other side of the coin is I have more owners, more supporters of the company, and it's better for me to have a wider network of supporters than smaller. Uh, so it's a balance. Uh, however, the one of the reasons why you may early in your journey want, uh, want one of the reasons why historically that's been a problem is because this is managed on paper and spreadsheets and not on systems. Once you start using systems, it can be much more organized and you can think of a wider cap table. The second reason why this is this becomes a constraint is uh, typically jurisdictions have restrictions on number of shareholders you can have. Like Singapore, mm -hmm. if you have more than 50 shareholders, you're a deemed public company. I think that number is closer to 200 in India and so on. So uh, so uh, that, uh, you know, increases the amount of reporting and compliance requirements on your company, which can be, a, which can be a, a, you know, a overhead in an early stage where you want to focus on the product you're building and so on. And so these are two reasons why overcrowding is typically an issue. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, yeah. So so how to manage for it? You use systems early on and, and so on. And second is, uh, you know, you you. At the, getting the right set of investors, the right base of uh, right investors for your startup journey and that alignment and that's a marriage uh, that's for the long term and therefore uh, you want uh, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't have your cap table in a way that you're spending too much time managing and uh, managing your investors uh, ra rather than focusing on company building. So that's answer to question one. The second, what type of instruments very early on we see safe notes or equity rounds um, that's common um, and uh, very early on but what once institutional investors start coming in, it's typically uh, preference shares. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes convertible notes are used as bridges between one round and another round when you can't actually value a company. So you link it to future valuation. If you think of uh, some the, the slides earlier on in this discussion, I talked about either the valuation is decided today or valuation is decided in future. And so convertible notes help you bridge that gap when you don't have, when you don't want to have a discussion around valuation today, you'd rather value in future when there are are better milestones, better metrics to value the company. So those are the, that's the typical journey in terms of instruments. That was super helpful, Ravi. So you said, um, you know, 50 um, investors or more constitutes a public company in Singapore. So if you have a few angels who come together and invest via a syndicate, is that considered one or however many members? Yeah, yes, Le legally one entity, a, a, a right. stakeholder on your cap table, which is your filing is one, one stakeholder. Now that particular entity has 10 stakeholders behind that. That's, uh, that's tip and so typically you use these, uh, these holding vehicles when you want to manage your number of stakeholders. Uh, that particular entity will have one, one say, like that, that entity will, will count as one unit as far as your cap table is concerned. 
Sounds good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now we've got a few questions around, you know, at the founder stage. Um, one of the questions that did come up quite a few times in our other uh, sessions in this series as well is how should founders think about um, co-founder splits? So Prashant Mathur has a question, um, mm -hmm. you know, is it a good idea to keep 80% with him and 20% with his co-founder um, and dilute only his share for future dilution when money is raised um, and share only his share for ESOP as well, or divide 50-50 so that the dilution happens equally. Yeah, so it's, uh, I, 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 it's, I won't answer specific case of uh, Prashant, but what, what, I, what I'll give is, I'll give a framework. Uh, typically, how to think of co-founder splits, think of value you bring to the table. Uh, and that's, a, that's the best way. It's an uncomfortable conversation early on with your co-founders, but you should have it. That will help you stay organized, especially co-founders. So in our case, uh, the three of us as co-founders in Capita, we had a discussion, we talked about it, we said this is the value each one brings and we decided, we actually documented it so that uh, there's no uh, confusion because this, we want this to be a long-term journey. It's like I said, uh, uh, the only thing longer than an investor and founder partnership is an investor co co is a founder and a co-founder partnership. Uh, and therefore you, 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 want to, you want to think about it in terms of uh, what value, what skills each one is bringing and therefore, uh, and, 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 and uh, stay organized as far as co-founder splits. Now, uh, so where exactly this ends up depends on what value you bring to the table. But what is more important than actually uh, deciding on this percentage is, is to actually have a framework early on so that you're actually not revisiting this because this can become a sensitive issue. And this is this is something key. You want this team to work with you over uh, sometimes, most of most of the times in successful companies, more than a decade. Uh, so uh, and and so that is one framework. And second, and, and then you, you, you are in a position to take a call, which for co-founder dilutes upon future fundraisers. Uh, should it should it be should it be one of them? Should it be all of them, and so on? And so that becomes easier. So I think first is to decide who is bringing what to the table, and then deciding on a framework. The simplest framework is when actually you are able to zero in on ownership right up front, and then any future dilutions, everyone gets diluted, and that is the simplest way. Like that is the fast. Then you are not spending too much time on these decisions in future. You're taking the burden up front, you're not kicking the can down the road, and then in all future fundraisers you have, you know, you're not revisiting it. Um, that's the simplest framework if you can get there. The earlier you get there, I think the better organized you will be. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Ravi. Um, so we had someone ask about, you know, further reading for cap table and venture um, equity slash debt classes. Um, we actually had one of our former speakers share a list of books. Um, so what we will do is that we will, um, you know, email out the titles to everyone after the event series is done. Um, because a lot of people have similar questions on that. Um, now I'm gonna move on to, there are a few questions around, you know, early stage employees and ESOPs. Um, so some of the common questions that we are getting is, I guess you already answered this, do companies usually give the employees the stock options or the stock itself? I guess it's the stock options, right? Before you- The existed. most common is stock options. We have, many, we have seen cases and it's also common to give shares upfront. It usually happens very early stage of the company when you don't want to kind of create a ESOP plan and, and, and all of that. Uh, but beyond a certain stage, it becomes uh, like infeasible to, uh, to, to, to keep giving shares for various reasons, right? One is every time you have regulatory filings, Second, uh, you have li limitations in terms of number of shareholders in a company and so on. And therefore to avoid that, you have stock option, which actually is more scalable. You can give it, uh, you know, for example, like you can you can make it an org wide stock option plan. Uh, you won't have limitations as your company grows and so on. So stock option is the most popular form. Uh, I, I would think 90% of the companies have option plans. Got that. Thank you so much, Ravi. Um, we've answered six and we've got 17 more to go. I definitely don't think we're going to be able to cover everything, um, but I'm just going to pick some of the ones that I see are kind of similar across where multiple people are asking this. Um, you know, there's a couple of questions around how you should think about allocating for senior leadership versus mm -hmm. rest of org. And also, do you feel like allocating to every employee is a good strategy? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? 
Uh, so, so g great question. Uh, I, so, this is this is uh, uh, so if you're using uh, so the, typically the issue like you know uh, if you're giving to a wide set of people the share becomes smaller and that's understood. Uh, but that's a good way to, to kind of think about behavior. If you ask me, what's the ideal state? Where 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 should the where, where should this trend towards? It should trend towards org wide distribution of ESOPs. That's where it should trend towards as an industry, as an eco, as a as a player in this ecosystem. I think that's when you have maximum amount of incentivization. Now, what's the problem with that typically? Historically, it's been management. How do you manage for all of this and all of, uh, and, and you know, how do you deal with this massive spreadsheet? Employees come, employees go, vesting schedules change, you're giving vesting starting from the day of your employment, all of this management of this becomes difficult. And therefore, um, you know, that's where we are investing our time and building a system, uh, you know, digital system to manage all of this and so on. And uh, that so that it becomes seamless, it becomes easy, and uh, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's basically where we are. Uh, that's where we are investing the time and so on. So once you use systems to manage, and there are systems today, and it becomes easier. Uh, as a, a so so the way to think about this is you always need to give a bigger sl slice of the pie to your senior talent and so on, and that's how you will be able to get them. Uh, if you're building a uh, building a product and you need to hire some experienced talent as you bring as you go on your journey of disruption of an industry that's already exists, which is typically the case for a startup, you will need to have, uh, get some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, strong talent on board. And so the way to think about it is to kind of think of your overall pool. What does it mean in terms of value? And if you have to distribute, you know, it's basically slicing a piece of cake. So if you, depending if you, how much you want to distribute, the slice of the cake becomes smaller. So that is understood, but you have to reserve certain slice of cake for talent you want to. Uh, so typically what we have seen is when you give org wide, you will have like a senior talent pool and you will have an org wide pool that, and then you plan in terms of where your organization grows from now till the next round when you can top up the ESOP pool and, and, uh, and plan. So in terms of charting your journey, planning for this becomes, it becomes an extremely useful tool to have a system and know how much of your ESOP pool is available for granting, how many people you are likely to add, how much of the ownership you want to give, right? Uh, the, the ideal state would be to give all wide again we have seen that this distribution in terms of org wide is changing but as companies grow and the startup ecosystem matures and as you know billions of dollars of value gets created in the startup ecosystem uh, i think you will have you'll see more wider and wider distribution of esops thanks ravi wow it what were companies doing before platforms like capita came about <laughs> Uh, so this uh, this problem is largely solved in the most like in Silicon Valley today when a startup right. gets incorporated it's almost always using a system it wasn't widely used in this part of the world and startup ecosystem was not that mature but uh, in 2021 I think we have a very mature robust uh, startup ecosystem in these these markets and so I think yeah there's a case for systems uh, it, it, that's our thesis anyway. Sounds good. Thank you, Ravi. And, um, you know, from an early stage employee perspective, we've got a couple of questions on this. You've already talked about tax and how it really depends on the country that you're in. Um, and in terms of like dilution, um, you know, and so we've got two questions. One is around dilution and one is around, you know, access to documents. So someone's asking like, you know, how do you make sure if you're an early stage employee to understand how your uh, ESOPs are going to be getting diluted or how to get ensure that it doesn't get diluted too much. And also, um, you know, someone's asking if you have like, say about 1% ownership in a company, are you, you know, do you have the rights to look at all of the documents? Like how does that kind of stuff work? Uh, so, uh, no, good questions. I think you, f first thing is in terms of documents, you should understand what your ESOP means. Uh, typically, if you want wide set of ESOPs being given in a company, uh, then you may not have access to all the documents in the company. So that's the trade-off, how many ESOPs you give and so on. So you have to understand constraints of your employer in terms of making certain type of documents wide. But there are certain documents you should know, and that's a part of the contract you get when you get your ESOP grant letter. So Knowing, understanding what every, uh, uh, you know, ev everything that that is stated in your ESOP letter is really important if you're an employee and that's your right and you should ask for understanding that. There's almost always an ESOP policy document or a plan document or an ESOP scheme as it is referred to in some uh, some countries. Uh, you should understand that. That's a part of documentation of your ESOP grant. Um, but uh, trying to kind of get 
uh, access to all of the uh, uh, entire cap table and legal documents of a company uh, may not be feasible, especially if you want the company to give org wide ESOP. So you have to understand the constraints of your employer as well, as well as what your rights are. Uh, just like you, it's your it's your right to understand what your salary means, what your pay slip means. Uh, you should you should have a right to understand what your ESOP compensation means. So understanding your letter ESOP document is what you should ask for. What does it translate to in terms of percentage ownership of company or value? Are also questions you have a right to ask because that is what is being uh, said to you. And if your company is using a system, uh, typically systems will have. Um, uh, you know, you, so for example, if your company is using Capita, you should be able to log in and see what your ESOP means at any point in time. That's that's a, that's a software solution we are building for startups. Yeah. That's great, Ravi. It sounds like this is super helpful um, for everyone, both like early stage founders as well as early stage employees. Um, I realize that we're actually about four minutes over and I know that you must have a busy day. Um, so to everyone at home, you know, some of you had like questions around like term sheets, etc. Join us next week for our session. Um, for some of your questions, it may have been covered in some of our previous workshops as well. Um, so all of these recordings, we're going to upload them a few days after the whole event series ends. Um, so yeah, do look out for it. Um, of course, you know, you can look up Ravi on socials. You can also go check out Capita. I'm sure they've got resources on their website for a lot of the questions that you have, because um, we saw a lot of like very similar questions. Um, so thank you so much for being such a great and engaged audience. And Ravi, thank Thank you so much for, um, you know, taking time out of your day to like, you know, share that great presentation. Everyone thought it was very sleek and very informative and for answering all of your questions on all of our audience questions. Yeah. So thank, thank you, Aziz. And thanks to General Assembly for having me here. Pleasure and a privilege. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And that was Ravi Ravalaparthi, everyone from Capita. Uh, do go check out their website. We will, of course, send you the link and stuff after the event series is done. Um, you know, do check out Lightbulb to launch for our event series, uh, series of events next week. Um, all right. Have a great weekend, everyone. And I hope the weather in Singapore gets better for the weekend. See ya. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.